Hi, everybody. Um, I just need the slide clicker. Um, so while we're looking for that, um, I'm really happy to be here. I'm looking forward to speaking with all of you. Oh, here it is. Uh, OK. Just a second, there's a battery missing. All right. Hmm. OK, let's see. Let's see if this works. Oh, there we go. OK, thank you for your patience. All right. Um, so I am Sarah Newman. Um, I've gotten to meet some of you uh, in uh, the past couple days, uh, which has been a pleasure. I'm really enjoying the conference. Thank you for inviting me. And um, I'm excited to share some of my work with you. Um, I have kind of an interesting job. Actually, I have a very interesting job. <clears throat> I'm called a creative researcher. And I work with an interdisciplinary lab at Harvard called MetaLab. Uh, and MetaLab is committed to bringing together art, technology, and the humanities to kind of explore research problems, many of which we've been discussing the past few days that range from technology and society to archives to libraries. Um, and what I bring is, uh, I'm an artist, so I bring um, an artistic bent, and we will get to that shortly. Uh, Sorry, I'm still having trouble with this clicker here. Um, OK, well, who here has seen the um, installation out in the lobby? Raise your hands. Actually, we're going to be doing a lot of hand raising, so don't be shy. OK, so um, th there's actually several installations out there. I'm, I'll just, can I just say next slide for, for when we go to the next slide? OK, that's two slides back. OK, now I think I'm working. OK, um, so I have an installation out in the lobby. It's called The Future of Secrets. And I'll be talking about that work. Um, and there's a picture of, of that on the left here. And then I'll also be talking about my new work, which is called Moral Labyrinth. Um, for those of you who haven't seen it, I encourage you um, to go um, explore that. It's um, just right out there. OK, so uh, I know uh, my colleague Kim Albrecht spoke just before this. And um, there was a question at the end about what we do at MetaLab. So I'm going to give you just a high level synopsis before diving into the two projects. Um, as I said, we you know, bring these different disciplines together. And I head up our area, the AI um, and experience area, where we use art as a way to explore questions that AI makes relevant. Um, this is different than using AI to make art. Uh, right, so a lot of us are familiar with algorithmic paintings. Um, we actually saw some demonstrations of other um, art generated by AI and music generated by AI earlier. Um, but I actually do something, and most of us do things that are not using AI specifically, but rather using art as a medium for exploration of social and philosophical dimensions of AI. Um, my background is in philosophy, and uh, my sort of interests are kind of this bridge between philosophy, psychology, and human experience. And ultimately, um, what I'm trying to do is figure out how we as people um, operate, how we can uh, be better and do better in the world. And I think that this technological moment is an opportunity for some deeper self-reflection. OK, so uh, my background is actually in photography. That's how I got into art in the first place. And um, so technology is a lens through which to see the world. Um, you know, cameras, these are um, camera obscura uh, images. And technology has often been a way uh, to see the world, as a lens to see the world. And I also think technology can be a lens to see ourselves. Uh, so what you'll see in these works is I'm using technology and raising questions um, from technology, but hoping to reflect back on, on the human experience and to make us more self-reflective and uh, maybe self-critical. OK, so raise your hand if you have a secret. Nice, OK. Raise your hand if you don't have any secrets. Wow, interesting. OK, uh, so most of us have secrets. And um, this project is. Um, as I mentioned, the future of secrets, I have two collaborators on this project, Rachel Kalmar and Jessica Yurkovsky, um, a technologist and a data scientist. Um, and this is a project of a couple years. Um, it's traveled a bunch, uh, and it's been in different countries, which has been interesting. And 
the basic installation, which you'll see outside, um, is that there's a prompt that asks you uh, to type in a secret. Um, and if you do, then a proprietary algorithm decides um, a secret that you should receive uh, when you put your secret in. So another secret prints out. Now sometimes the secret seems related, sometimes it doesn't seem related, but you get to keep somebody else's secret um, and take it with you. Um, there's also some sound elements to it. Um, these are, uh, this is an installation uh, earlier this year in Austin, but you can see there's the computer to type in secrets and then there's also like this interactive sound installation and there's some other elements. But a number of things happen that are kind of curious. Um, here are some secrets that have come in. Uh, so one thing that we noticed is that people uh, attributed a lot of intelligence to the machine. It's actually a very, very simple uh, system. And this made me realize that when we don't understand how something's working, we can project logic onto it. And there was a talk earlier about sort of connecting the dots. And um, it's, it's a, real, a really natural human tendency to take these disparate elements um, that we observe and tell stories about them, make meaning from them. You know, mythology comes from that. And right now in a time where we don't always understand how the algorithms work and, and sometimes AI cannot be explainable, especially as it gets more and more sophisticated, I think it's important to shine a light on this tendency of ours, our tendency to tell stories about why the machine is giving you the secret in this case and what the machine might know about you. Because um, as these technologies are pretty oblique, if we're, if we're telling a story about what's happening, recognizing that we might be telling a story that we're interpreting, is useful moving forward. This is a visualization from a, a previous installation. Some more secrets. Uh, one thing that's interesting is that people don't, uh, we don't know what's gonna happen. So, you know, you're supposed to take it with you or like, that's what we expected. But in this case, people just left them behind. And so there are these, these piles of secrets. Um, and so sometimes you can read a lot of secrets at once. Um, and another thing that started to happen was that um, people seem to feel kind of happy from reading all of these secrets, even though many of them are, are super dark. Um, that was something that really surprised me. Um, and I think it's one of these rare instances where technology brings out our own humanness. Uh, it's so different than what you see people posting on social media where everybody posts you know, their best pictures and everybody looks you know, generally happy and is bragging about all the cool things they're doing and whatnot. Um, in this case, it's not tied to an identity so people can be more vulnerable and more open. And somehow reading a lot of these secrets uh, can make us realize that like everybody's fucked up, you know, just not just me. And, and, and it's very humanizing. And so I think it's, it's really useful to, to recognize that there are these moments in these ways that technology can be humanizing um, and elicit compassion. Uh, so if you read a secret that's kind of dark or disturbing uh, and you don't know if it was typed by somebody standing beside you or if it was somebody across the world, but not knowing that, being in a space where you don't know where the secrets came from, it kind of makes you feel more compassion towards everybody because you don't know who they belong to. Like we all kind of keep our secrets on the inside. Um, but of course it also raises questions about how we relate to machines and it's meant to be a critical piece about why we're so willing uh, to use these technologies that we don't quite understand and that we don't, where we don't own our data to transact this really um, private information in many cases. And my interest is less about uh, you know, being tracked by advertising and whatnot, which is, I think, important, and lots of people are working on that. My interest is more philosophical in nature, uh, more about what happens in the long-term future. Um, who might read our secrets? What kinds of collections of material are we leaving behind? What sorts of history might be told, you know, in 100 years' time, for example? If, like, these fragments that we leave and our, these digital traces that we leave are read by our grandchildren or our great-grandchildren? Is that an accurate portrayal of, of who we are or who we want to be? Um, this work was inspired by um, an essay uh, by the German philosopher Nietzsche, which was written in 1874. Uh, the English, it's super relevant now, um, the English translation of the title is um, On the Advantage and Disadvantage of History for Life, or On the Use and Abuse of History for Life. Um, it was part of his un Untimely Meditations. I highly recommend it. It's very short and super relevant. Um, and essentially the argument is that, you know, what makes humans unique is that we tell stories, that we have memory, we have culture, and we're able to tell stories about our culture to our, our children and pass things along that we learn. Um, and so some 
level or degree of recollection and memory is really useful and productive, but too much memory can be really stifling and really um, uh, like suppress us, suppress our creativity. Um, and you know, so it's like this delicate balance between remembering and forgetting that's super important. And I think in a time where we're putting more information about ourselves online than ever before, um, this essay was an interesting uh, thing to return to uh, and think about you know, how much history is useful for us right now, and how much of the information we have about ourselves is accurate or is true, or even if it is true, is useful to leave behind. Um, here's a couple just from yesterday, and then I'm gonna play a, a, just a sound sample uh, of some of the sound you can hear on the headphones. Babies. I killed a bunny when I was seven. I keep LSD in my philosophy books. Evie is a Russian spy, but I still love her. About me. I've lied about my identity my whole my life. My friend microwaved her hamster and it died. I'm gay and my boyfriend is straight. I once scratched a car when I you was will six disappear years old. I smoked to bring the world closer to me. Okay, that's I good. That's good. Uh, I write erotic novels. Um, so I invite you to go outside. There's a lot of secrets to hear. And um, I've been told that it's quite addictive, which is interesting. Okay, so... Um, I did this with the secrets. So my current project is on values and morality. So raise your hand if you have values. That's good, okay. Good people. Um, so uh, most of us have values and um, for those people that are in the AI space, um, there's a, a problem called the value alignment problem that's uh, pretty important and to some people it could be, including to me, it could be the largest existential threat to humanity. It's also super overhyped, like everything in AI can be, um, and I think it's good to recognize that for those of us who are in the space. Um, but it's still important. Um, and going back to this idea of um, technology being a lens through which we can see the world and see ourselves, personally, I feel like this value alignment problem is a chance to reflect on moral philosophy and reflect on values. And yes, we're aspiring to get better um, and make better AI, but also as a result of being really critical and honest and thorough about what we value and why we value things, hopefully we can be better too. Uh, so this is a new work. Um, the pictures I'm gonna show you are from an exhibit two weeks ago at Ars Electronica Festival in uh, Austria. And um, it's still ongoing. Uh, and one of the things about my work is that I design it to change each time I show it. Um, so secrets, each time it's been shown, it's been different. Um, same with Moral Labyrinth. Um, I sort of expand and contract the work. I respond to how to what's interesting to me and what people are, how they're reacting. And the work itself evolves. Um, I really like working in this way and I also really like working um, in installation art because it's literally um, dialogical. And following Emily's presentation just before mine, um, her work was so much about sort of dialogue and the, the psychological impacts of dialogue. And, and my work is meant to be dialogical too. Um, as I mentioned, my background is in philosophy, and Moral Labyrinth, um, actually, Moral Labyrinth is, is kind of a, a Socratic dialogue with the viewer. Um, so for those of you who are not familiar with the value alignment problem, um, I won't go into too much detail, but um, essentially it asks, how do we ensure that AI systems of the future act in accordance with human values? Seems important, right? Um, it's pretty complicated because uh, we don't agree on what we value um, across cultures. Um, we don't agree across individuals. And even unto ourselves, we have certain values that are in conflict with other values. And then if that wasn't enough, we also act differently than what we say we, what we, say we value. So we say we value one thing, but we act in some other way. And most of us do this. Most of us are hypocrites at some point. And so it's a really complicated problem. And for about the past um, 50 years in philosophy, it's kind of talking about morality has gone a little bit out of vogue. You know, it's like to each their own and you know, they'll, you'll do your thing, I'll do my thing. Well, now we're at a time where um, AI systems, especially as we're making them more complex and potentially reaching um, a level of in intelligence that's gonna potentially be generalized, um, we need to program certain values into an AI. So um, for example, um, there's, a, there's, well, I don't wanna go into too much technical detail, but uh, you can have really good intentions, but if your really good intentions are not um, complemented with some really important things for the AI to not do, 
some really bad things can happen. Um, so an example of this would be you say like uh, eradicate some disease. So it's like let's say in the future, let's say in 20 years, uh, there's an AI and it's connected to the internet and networked and everything. And you don't really understand how it works and you say like, okay, eradicate this disease and that's all you tell it. Um, well, most diseases can only exist in living organisms. And so if the AI is really smart, it may start by doing some really what seem like good things, like, oh, it's running some tests and it's doing this and that. But eventually, if you don't tell it anything else, you don't tell it, you know, preserve human life or don't destroy the environment or preserve animal life or all the other things that we, we value as a culture, um, then the consequences can be really grave. And especially if we don't understand how it's working, um, it could be really bad. And right now, um, computer scientists and engineers are the ones who are building AIs. But obviously, the conversation about values and what's right and good and, and just, in my opinion, should be a much broader conversation that's not limited to a specific domain. Um, so, uh, so this is the labyrinth. It's a walking labyrinth. And it's, um, as I said, it's a Socratic dialogue in that you, you, know, you walk through it, and you're asked these questions, and you're meant to reflect on the questions. Um, so some of the questions are like, is it wrong to kill ants? Uh, you know, seems like it's simple, but if you start to read some of the other questions um, and you think about like how those could be extrapolated or what your values are, um, the goal is that you start to realize that actually most of us have pretty deeply conv conflicting values. Um, the goal of the piece um, is for people to walk the labyrinth and reflect on these things and hopefully walk away with more curiosity, um, more understanding of the complexity of the space and more um, interest and commitment to getting clearer and realizing the importance of thinking about these questions now. Um, here's an image of um, some people walking through the labyrinth. There's also an interactive version that you can see in the corner there. Um, and so basically, um, just like zooming back for one second, um, the reason that I do this kind of work, because like, I'm technically I'm a researcher, uh, but the output of my research is not uh, studies or white papers. The output of my research is this interactive art. Um, and the reason for that is because I think questions are really important to be asking. And a lot of research, um, especially in academia, prioritizes answers and conclusions. And I think philosophy and art and a lot of other sort of creative media that we've been discussing at this conference are particularly good at asking questions. And I think right now is a super important time to be asking questions. Um, so just three provocations. Um, to leave you with. Uh, one is, what is the value of lingering in the question space and not being too quick to jump to answers? What does it mean that those inside a particular discipline are often the ones who get it most wrong? And how can we use art or other media to engage a wider audience in questions about AI and other emerging technologies? Thank you.